Once again, happy Mother's Day. By the way, <clears throat> if, if any gentlemen, if any of you didn't understand what was funny about that last part, you need to see me after the service. It's urgent that I explain some things to you. Now, what a wonderful opportunity to be with you. Beautiful music. Megan, thank you for that song. And a great chance to celebrate the ladies in our midst. And like I say, celebrate whatever the circumstance, love and cherish you. That's our point. That's our key. That you matter to us and we are grateful for you and all that you bring to our lives. You know, it's interesting because as we're moving through this series, we started last weekend. It's called Learning the Hard Way, and it's on the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon wrote that book. Now, think about this. Here's Solomon. God gives Solomon wisdom. So he's the wisest man that ever lives, and still he insists on learning the hard way. Instead of living according to the wisdom that God gave him, Solomon is constantly pushing the limits, testing things, trying things. Solomon is learning from the school of hard knocks. Anybody else know about that school? Okay, if you're not raising your hand, you're lying. Because we all know about that school. In fact, moms, you know, it's not your fault. But if you are a mom, you are absolutely enrolled in both the most prestigious and the most rigorous school in the university system of hard knocks, right? Being a mom is tough, and it's challenging, and it's overwhelming, and it's frustrating. It's all those things. In fact, when we're thinking about this, this whole concept, the reality is that, that for moms, there are lots of times when, when you're struggling, and it has nothing to do with you or what you've done, and yet you still take it on yourself. You know, if your kids are are having a bad time, if your kids are struggling, if your kids are wandering off a, a good or healthy path, if they're involved in some kind of destructive or, or bad behavior, moms, I know how it is for you. You tend to say to yourself, what did I do wrong? How in the world did I miss this? And it can lead us, lead any of us to the point of saying to ourselves, no matter what I do, nothing seems to work. Everything seems futile. Well, that sounds like Solomon, doesn't it? If you were here last weekend, we, we began with chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes where Solomon starts out in verse 2. Already the second verse of Ecclesiastes, he says, absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. Solomon knows what it feels like. In fact, Solomon, for all of his wisdom, through this school of hard knocks, by the way, you remember the battle cry of the school of hard knocks? Yeah, for all of his struggle and all of his pain, Solomon has reached this point of frustration where he says, nothing matters, nothing works, there is no purpose. Well, as we move into chapter 2, Solomon goes on a, an experiment. And it's kind of interesting because he's writing about his experiment and then he sort of inserts his field notes into the midst of our reading in chapter 2. And the experiment is to figure out, is there anything under the sun? Is there any kind of, of pursuit, any kind of pleasure, any kind of enjoyment that lasts, that, that stays, that lingers, that gives meaning and purpose to life? So he's going to try all kinds of things. Chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, go ahead. I will test with pleasure. Enjoy what is good. And so he's going, to, he's going to go through this long list of things. We're going to take a look at just a few of them. But he's going to test all of these different types of pleasures. All of the things that people say bring pleasure and joy and, and, and excitement and enthusiasm to life. Solomon's going to test them all. But already in chapter 2, verse 1, in the second half of the verse, he inserts those field notes, his commentary. But it turned out to be futile. I had said about laughter, it is madness, and about pleasure, what does this accomplish? You get that sense of despair, don't you? That Solomon's going to try all of these things, but the fact is, he's telling us right up the bat, I tried them all. Nothing was meaningful. Nothing had purpose. No pleasure lasted. 
He says, I explored with my mind the pull of wine on my body, with my mind guiding me with wisdom and how to grasp the folly until I could see what, good, what, what is good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. Now that makes it sound like Solomon's thinking about drinking wine. In the NIV version, it says, I tried cheering myself with wine. That literally... One of the things that Solomon does is that he, he takes the whole idea of strong drink, of wine, and he's going to pursue that. The whole idea of, of just drinking yourself to oblivion as a way of finding happiness or pleasure or delight, a way of escaping the world. You know, it's interesting. You and I have escapes as well. We have ways that we try to cheer ourselves. And I wonder what, what they are. What is it for you? Maybe it is alcohol or, or drugs, some other substance that you use as an escape. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a, a vacation or travel or, or, or getting away to a place. Maybe your escape is work. You know, it's interesting. Some people escape reality by, by plowing into their work. It's fascinating, Solomon even tries that. In, in a little later in the chapter, Solomon says, all my eyes desired, I did not deny them. So in other words, any pleasure, any possibility, any pursuit that someone said brings happiness or joy or lasting pleasure, anything I, my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. And what's interesting is that the word for struggles is the word for work. Solomon even tried Work, pouring himself into his work, becoming a workaholic to find an escape from the difficult parts of life. Maybe, maybe your escape is a hobby, something that you, you do as an avocation, or maybe it's volunteering. What's, what's your escape? And how's it working out? Are you finding lasting pleasure or... If it doesn't work out so well, maybe you find yourself in the same place as Solomon. Solomon goes on in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 11, when I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything, everything to be futile and a pursuit of the wind. What's a pursuit of the wind, right? You chase and chase and grab and you still have nothing. I found everything to be futile and a pursuit of the wind, there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Now, if we leave it there, that's pretty doggone discouraging, isn't it? But Solomon is a guy who's, who's beaten down. As we said before, the, the battle cry of the school of hard knocks is, ouch, it's hard. And so Solomon has got himself into a point where he's chased all of these other means of, of pleasure and satisfaction and purpose, and, and he's found himself at a point where there's nothing that works for him. You and I don't need to follow his, his example. In fact, what I'd like to suggest today is that rather than, than following Solomon in that pursuit of, of pleasure in the school of hard knocks, you and I can learn from his lessons and we can learn from God's word and we can do it better. So what I want to share with you are three lessons on pleasure. Now, for those of you who are around all the time, you know I'm going to ask you to write these down. For those of you who are not, take it or leave it. You don't have to write it down if you don't want, but here's the reason I ask you to write it down. You may just find yourself in a conversation talking about something that connects directly to this. See, we live in a world that is in a constant quest for pleasure. It's not just Solomon. It's not just the, the people of his time that were living and pursuing pleasure. Our world's doing the very same thing. And if we don't understand these three points about pleasure, we can find ourselves in a situation where we end up frustrated and saying it's all just futile. There's no meaning. We're chasing the wind. It doesn't have to be that way. So point number one, when it comes to pleasure, point number one, pleasure is not profligate. And I, I want to apologize right, right off the bat. See, I, I've told you before, Pastor Zach and I work on all of these messages together. And Pastor Zach loves 
That's not even strong enough. Pastor Zach is passionate about alliterations. If you've got three points and you can start them all with the same letter, he's euphoric. I mean, he just comes out of his skin. He's so happy. When you hear a word like profligate come out of my mouth, you know it's not coming from my brain. (laughs) So profligate. Profligate means an extravagant waste, right? Let's go with that for the moment. Pleasure is not an extravagant waste. Now, there are guilty pleasures, right? There are pleasures that are a waste or pleasures that are actually destructive. I mean, we mentioned about the whole idea and escape in, into drugs or alcohol. We know that there's nothing wrong with a glass of wine, that the Scripture even talks about it, but moderation is the key because that glass of wine can turn into abuse, and that abuse can turn into di- addiction, and that addiction is destructive, and it tears lives apart, and that is profligate. Or work, for example. We know that that hard work is a biblical principle. We know that hard work is good, but hard work can also lead to neglect, and neglect can can leave families broken and hurting and relationships suffering, and that neglect can turn into workaholism, and workaholism, like any addiction, is destructive. The two keys to understanding this idea of pleasure are, number one, moderation, and number two, discernment. Making a a clear evaluation. When I talk about discernment, it really comes down to the idea of whether it's it's good or whether it's bad. Now that brings us to, to two important principles. One with regard to pleasure, one is called asceticism. And asceticism is a philosophy that says all pleasure is bad. There's even a part of, of Christianity that says all pleasure is bad, that you should beat yourself and that you should, when you're bloody and when you're suffering, that's when you are truly faithful. So asceticism says all, all pleasure is bad. The opposite end of the spectrum is hedonism. And there are even branches of Christianity that embrace hedonism. It says, all pleasure is good. No matter what you want, no matter how you want it, no matter what it is, all pleasure is good. You should pursue it. That's not right either. The reality is that it's something in the middle. That pleasure can be good and it can be bad. That that there's a a discernment that's necessary. In fact, the, the key to making that discernment is maybe as simple as this. Is this pleasure destructive or is it restorative? Is it, does it restore me, replenish me? God intends for us to, to experience recreation, right? Recreation, we call it. God wants us to be renewed and refreshed. And so is the pleasure that we're talking about destructive or restorative? That helps us make that discernment. So number one, pleasure is not profligate. It's not just an extravagant waste. Number two, pleasure is not permanent. This is a a really important point. We live in a culture that's pursuing pleasure, but here's the thing. If you are living for pleasure, you always need more, and you always need the next thing, and you always need another grasp, another reach. You're always living on the end. In fact, I, I love what it says in Proverbs. The one who loves pleasure will become poor. Why? Because you're always needing more. It doesn't last, and so you run out and you need something more. But the pleasure that made you happy before isn't enough, so you need more, and you need more, and you need more, and you can't sustain that kind of pursuit. Pleasure is not permanent. You know, I was thinking about that in terms of... uh, my experience with the kids of the congregation. I, I, you know I love kids, and I love the kids in our congregation. Didn't you love that little guy? Children with sin in their heart. <laughs> I thought, dude, preach it, man. Go for it. <laughs> but, the, you know, the funny thing is that, that when kids are, are tiny, when they're babies, they're great with me. Because, you know, I'm, I'm big and I'm warm and, you know, my voice is kind of soothing to them. And so babies do pretty good with me. And when they get a little older, three years old or so, I can talk to them and, and laugh with them and give them high fives and they're good with me again. But in that period of about 18 months or so, it's not such a great time. 
I mean, I, in fact, I know, I love it. Some of you guys, you, you, your kids are, are out there and they want to come and say hi to me, so you come over to see me. But here's the, the way it works. They see me up here. They may even have me confused with Jesus, which we both know is a huge mistake. But they see me up here. I've got on this white robe. This light is shining on me. And if I get just right, it almost looks like I've got a halo. It's pretty awesome, right? And they think, holy man, I want to meet him in their own little minds, right? So they say to you, I want to say hi to pastor. And so you're, you're bringing him across the entryway over to the doorway to, to greet me. And, and they see the white robe and it, I looked a little different, but there's still that, that guy who was up there in this holy, wonderful thing. And as you get closer and closer, the real me begins to show up. I want to tell you, for all of those little ones who think they want to say hi to me over here, when they get up close and personal, it turns into pure terror. I mean, there are kids trying to jump out of their parents' arms to get away from me, right? Because I'm not nearly, nearly as engaging out there as I am right here. I think it is the lighting thing. If I'm So that wonderful pleasure turns into that terror. But isn't that kind of how it always works? Those things that look so wonderful, they look like a panacea. They look like exactly what our heart's longing for. We see that advertisement, we hear that story, we see that person, and in our minds we tell ourselves, that's what I want. And we get there, and it's not nearly as cool as we thought. I mean, even, even motherhood. I mean, the concept of motherhood is nothing but pure beauty. In fact, I saw a picture this morning. I, I, she may even be here. One of our, our beautiful young members. She's, she's going to be a mom, and she's standing on Facebook. She has this, this absolutely beautiful smile on her face, and she's got her hands on her belly like this. And I'm thinking to myself, that's, that's the picture. That's the concept of motherhood, right? This beautiful, amazing, glorious picture of what it's going to be like. But I was also thinking to myself, that poor girl has got a lot of messes ahead of her. <laughs> right? I mean, Mom, think about, think about the reality. One of the reasons why I make the, the statement I do at the beginning of this service about wherever you are on Mother's Day is because while there are some moms, some of you are having the, the best weekend that you ever remember. There are other moms who are, who are struggling. There are families who are grieving the loss of a mom. There are families who are, who are going through broken times. They've, their kids have wandered away and, and their hearts are broken. My goodness, we need to be praying this morning. One of our interns who's been with us for several years, Caitlin McCarthy, is also a leader in Young Life. I don't know if you know this story or not. Caitlin's fine. She and her team were ahead, but there were a number of teams from College Station, and they were headed to Colorado for a Young Life week, a week of planning and worship and things like that. One of the cars that was driving along experienced a blowout, and that car flipped. At least one beautiful, faithful, wonderful young woman from Texas A&M perished. There's another man clinging, fighting for his life. Those families, their families went from, from this, this day of rejoicing for Mother's Day yesterday, planning and, and looking forward to Mother's Day becoming actually a, a day of grief, terrible brokenness. In fact, let's just pause for a minute. Father, we lift that Young Life team and their friends and their family and especially, Lord, the family of that young woman whose life ended. We thank you for her faith, and we know that she's safe with you. But we lift all of those who are grieving and dismayed. Ask for your blessing and comfort in Jesus' name. Amen. Doesn't end there. Not only are there families who are hurting and grieving, they're, they're moms here today, and while things are good with their kids, their life is upside down because their marriage is broken. 
Or are there other moms who are, who are doing this all by themselves, single moms? My goodness, think about that. I always marvel when I watch moms come in. Some of them are single or not, but they're by themselves oftentimes when they're bringing kids to school. And I marvel at the things that they're juggling just to get life put together, just to get their kids to school. Sometimes there are ladies in our congregation, beautiful women who want to be moms, and it hasn't happened. You get my point, right? Motherhood's a perfect example of this, that, that beautiful picture of, of joy and delight. The reality is that in the midst of it, there's lots of pain. But before we, before we just kind of move on, I want to mention something that's, that's maybe not pleasant to hear, but it's important. You realize that there are very few times that we learn important lessons through pleasure. But pain? Pain can be a great teacher. I mean, moms, again, think about you. Think about all the things you've learned through the struggles of being a mom, things like patience, resourcefulness. You can't be a mom without being resourceful, right? You learn conflict resolution. Enough said, right? You learn persuasion. And you learn love. Honestly, there's, there's no greater teacher about love, especially what the love of God is, no greater teacher than being a parent. Because you have these children that you would give your life for. You have these children that in one moment are wonderful, and the next moment they're telling you that they hate you. But your heart for them doesn't change. And through that pain, you learn about the love of our God, our Heavenly Father. See, the reality is, dear brothers and sisters, pleasure is not profligate, but pleasure is not permanent. Point number three, pleasure is profound. It's it's extraordinary. But the thing is, sometimes you and I miss that point because we get ourselves so distracted. See, we're so hungry for pleasure. We're so hungry for delight that lots of times we settle for silly pleasure or even false pleasure. Let me give you an example, tender illustration. What kind of jokes do you tell? What kind of jokes do you laugh at? Because sometimes the, the jokes that we tell, the things that we laugh at, They're really not worthy. They're really not what pleasure is intended to be. You know, have you ever caught yourself and and someone tells a joke and you might even laugh at it, but on the inside you're kind of going, ooh, too far. Can you ever imagine our God hearing the things that we say, the jokes that we tell, and going, ooh, come on, you're better than that. Or get this, So God has this masterpiece life for us, right? I've told you about this. Ephesians 2.10, that God has a masterpiece life that he created and has recreated us for. He's planned out this whole lifetime of good works, this whole lifetime of pleasure and and joy and, and all kinds of things that he has in mind for us. And I wonder if sometimes you and I, we get on that detour to some kind of false pleasure or we take that path to some kind of silly pleasure and instead of experiencing the real, the the profound pleasure he has for us, we're off in the weeds somewhere else, and I wonder if God's ever going, oh, doggone it. Bill, I wanted so much better for you today than that. But now that masterpiece part is going to have to wait until you get yourself out of those weeds. You think he ever cringes and says, man, there's, you're, you're settling for something way, way beneath what I have for you. Because God intends pleasure to be profound. An example, your spouse Brothers and sisters who are married, God intends your spouse to be a profound pleasure to you. In fact, a a little later, uh, pardon me, in in Proverbs chapter 5, it says, take pleasure in the wife of your youth, that God intends your spouse to be this, this delight, this profound pleasure for you. Another example, your children, at least sometimes. 
In Psalm 127, or, or pardon me, Psalm, yeah, 127, it says, children are a blessing and a gift from the Lord, that God intends that our children are supposed to be this incredible blessing and this gift from God, that he wants us to find profound pleasure in them. That's not silliness, that's not distraction. That's a source of joy. And by the way, make no mistake, when you ask your mom what she wants for Mother's Day and she says, I want you to come to worship with me, it's because you are most important. You are the source of pleasure in her life that's profound. That brings me to point number three. Another source of profound pleasure is God. Here's what God says in Psalm 37, 4. This is probably a verse you ought to memorize because it's a promise as well as a verse. Take delight in the Lord, take pleasure in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's amazing, right? Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, why is that? Because God delights in you. In, in Psalm 149, it says, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He, God, he, he sees you, he knows your strengths and your weaknesses, your good days and your bad days, and he still delights in you. He takes pleasure in you, and so he wants to give you the desires of your heart. Here's a word picture I like even better. Now think of this. Almighty God, this, this conqueror, this hero, this creator of heaven and earth, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. Now get this. This is the part that's stunning to me. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Did you realize God, when he thinks about you, he rejoices, he's singing a song. You say, well, what, what's, that, what's that even mean? Here's the picture. Have you ever seen somebody who's working away? They're working like crazy, but they love their work. So all the while, they're whistling a song. Have you seen that? That's the picture. Or have you ever seen someone? I'm thinking of, of my grandma. My grandma used to make these incredible feasts for the family. And she'd be working like crazy and sweat coming off her brow and, and all kinds of effort going to this, all kinds of planning early in the morning. And, and lo and behold, as she's making this food, she's singing a song. Because the work she's doing is for the people that she loves and it delights her. Get this picture. Almighty God, mighty warrior, creator of the universe, gets so caught up when he thinks about you and when he's working with you and when he's forgiving your sins and when he's bringing you out of trouble and when he's celebrating your victories. Almighty God, when he's thinking about you, is working away, singing a song about you. That is how much he delights in you. You bring a song to his heart. Now, We've got to bring that into focus, right? And there's this wonderful section in the crucifixion story that you, you have to then understand. It's the scene where Jesus is hanging on the cross and the people at the bottom of the cross are hurling insults and they're, they're saying all kinds of ugly things. And one of the things that they're saying is, let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. In other words, if he comes off the cross, if he saves himself, we'll believe in him. And then they go on. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. If he takes pleasure in him. In other words, they're saying, you know what? This guy claims to be the son of God. God. He claims that God loves him. He claims he's doing God's work. If God's so pleased with him, let him come down off the cross and save himself. Let God deliver him. If he really takes pleasure in him. But you know what happens? He doesn't come off the cross. He hangs there and he dies there. So what does that mean? Well, one of the things that you know it doesn't mean 
is that God wasn't pleased with Jesus because God tells us, God speaks for himself in the Gospels in a number of places. In fact, in Mark's Gospel in particular, when Jesus is baptized, all the people who are standing around hear God say to Jesus, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So what does it mean that that God doesn't deliver him? Dear friends, what it means is that God God is so delighted with you. He loves you so profoundly that in those moments on the cross, he would turn away from Jesus as he carries God's displeasure with sin, our sin. Let him take our place and die so he could be restored to you. He could take delight in you for eternity. You know, my prayer is that you and I, we learn from Solomon's struggle. That we understand that that pain is not an extravagant waste. We learn that that pain isn't permanent. And we learn that pain is, uh, uh, pardon me, pleasure, pardon me. That pleasure is not a waste and that pleasure is not permanent. But that pleasure, the pleasure God has for you and me, that it is profound. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you are a God who saves and a God who loves and a God who takes delight in his children even to the point of singing over us. Lord, help us to rejoice in that and understand that that you intend for our lives to be lives blessed with pleasure. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day.